The safest company in aviation history had just built a plane that killed 346 people in only five months. Regulators worldwide grounded every Boeing 737 MAX. Hundreds of new jets worth over $50 billion was the single biggest financial grounding that the industry had ever faced. A company built on trust had become aviation's biggest liability. For decades, their goal was simple, build the best aircraft in the world. Every design from the 747 to the 777 was an engineering statement. But over time, that goal changed. Success stopped meaning better planes. It started meaning higher margins. The company that once chased perfection began chasing its own share price. Inside the factories, that shift was visible. Today, almost half the world's short-haul flights still depend on Boeing jets, which means what happens inside this company affects how millions of people fly every day. February 2001, a 6.8 magnitude quake hit Seattle, damaging Boeing's offices and forcing hundreds of engineers out. Instead of rebuilding elsewhere, the company moved those engineers directly into its 737 factory, a decision that would transform how Boeing built aircraft and quietly plant the seeds of the crisis that came later. And yet, after all of this, Boeing may have finally turned the corner. The earthquake scattered Boeing's 737 team. Instead of rebuilding offices, the company moved everyone into the Renton factory. Engineers sat next to machinists and fixed problems as they came up. The aim was simple, build faster, waste less. For a while, it worked. At the same time, Boeing was overhauling how its jets were built. Throughout the late 1990s, the company embraced lean manufacturing methods pioneered in the auto industry. Executives studied Toyota's techniques and adopted just-in-time supply chains to eliminate wasteful inventory. By 2000, these ideas had reached the factory floor. Boeing cleared out decades of clutter, sold off excess stock, and reconfigured the Renton plant for efficiency. The production line itself was revolutionized. Instead of parking each 737 at a static bay, Boeing installed a moving assembly line, the first ever for a commercial airliner. Jets now inched steadily forward during assembly, about two inches per minute, keeping work flowing continuously. Parts and tools arrived just in time at the point of use, and any delay was immediately flagged by visual signals on the line. Lean practices paid off, and the effect was immediate. Output doubled, assembly time halved, and Boeing finally looked more like a tech company than a traditional manufacturer. With fewer bottlenecks and a unified team, the Renton factory ramped up output to over 30 planes per month by 2010, double its previous rate, and slashed the final assembly time per 737 from 20 two days to just 11. Boeing turned a devastating quake and the post 9-11 industry slowdown that followed into an opportunity to restructure and come back stronger. Boeing's product lineup thrived alongside these process improvements. The 737 Next Generation series was a commercial success, tapping into airline demand for efficient short-haul jets. First delivered in 1997, the 737NG kept pace with Airbus's A320 and became the best-selling airliner of its era. Nearly 8,000 next generation 737s would take to the skies over the next 20 years, a testament to Boeing's ability to deliver a reliable, economical workhorse for carriers worldwide. On the long haul side, the wide body 777 also dominated its market. With its high capacity and long range, the 777 became the world's most popular long range wide body jet, surpassing all other twin aisle aircraft in sales. By the mid 2000s, Boeing was winning on both fronts, short haul and long long haul, single aisle, and twin. This was peak Boeing. The company's blend of efficient production and dependable products had vaulted it to the top of the aviation industry. Inside the Renton plant, the new collaborative culture, placing engineers and builders side by side, fostered continuous improvements and a sense of pride in workmanship. Outside, Boeing's jets earned a reputation for quality and reliability, reinforcing the firm's status as the epitome of American manufacturing might. Having turned adversity into advantage, Boeing was seen as the the benchmark for aerospace innovation and performance. But Boeing would soon find out that staying on top was far more challenging than getting there. By the late 2000s, subtle signs of strain were emerging. Boeing would soon face a new set of challenges that would test the very foundations of its success, setting the stage for a dramatic collapse. In 2003, Boeing launched its most ambitious project yet, 
the 787 Dreamliner. This jet promised to revolutionize air travel with cutting edge technology. It was the first airliner built mainly from carbon fiber composites rather than aluminium, making it lighter and more fuel efficient. Boeing boasted that it could do all of this for less than half the development cost of its previous flagship, the 777. Expectations from airlines were sky high. To cut costs and speed development, Boeing's new management tried a radically different approach, outsourcing an unprecedented amount of design and manufacturing work to suppliers around the world. Major sections of the 787 were farmed out to foreign partners. Japanese firms built the wings, Italy's Alenia made parts for the fuselage, and Vought in the United States constructed the rear section. These contractors didn't follow Boeing's blueprints. Many designed their own sections as well. Boeing also didn't pay most of them up front, so each supplier had to cover its own costs and hope to recoup the investment later through Dreamliner sales. Boeing had tremendous leverage in the industry and could impose this deal on suppliers. It controlled roughly half of the global aircraft market, so a Boeing contract was almost impossible to refuse. Say no and you risk losing Boeing's business forever. Most suppliers agreed to Boeing's terms despite the financial risk. For Boeing, this pay-to-play scheme seemed like a brilliant plan. The company could build its advanced new airline at a fraction of the usual R&D cost by offloading much of the risk and expense onto its partners. But cracks soon appeared in this plan. Coordinating a global network of suppliers proved far more difficult than Boeing expected. The 787 program ran into delays and eventually fell about three years behind schedule. The problems became obvious at Boeing's much-hyped rollout event in July 2007. The company unveiled the first 787 in front of a huge crowd, but the gleaming jet was just an empty shell. Observers on the factory floor could see straight through the interior. Large sections were missing and almost no systems were installed. Key components like wiring, electronics and plumbing were incomplete because many parts arrived late or just didn't fit properly. For a plane I was so excited for, it was insanely emblematic of the real situation at the heart of the company. Engineering excellence gave way to marketing and PR. The reality was that Boeing's global supply chain was out of sync, leaving a long-awaited plane nowhere near ready for its first flight. And even after Boeing got the 787 off the ground, more trouble followed. The plane was packed with new technology, and not all of it worked smoothly. One new feature was its use of lithium-ion batteries to power many of the systems, a first for the commercial jet. Soon after after the 787 entered service, those batteries started overheating and even caught fire on a couple of planes. In 2013, barely a year after the Dreamliner's debut, Boeing had to ground every 787 for months to fix the battery design. Boeing eventually overcame many of the Dreamliner's early woes, and the 787 became a hit with airlines. It delivered the promised fuel savings and gave passengers a smoother ride. By 2023, Boeing had delivered its 1100th Dreamliner, and still had hundreds more on order. Yet for all of this success, Boeing still hadn't broken even on the 787 program after more than a decade of production. It became totally clear that along the way, the company had not only lost control over its own product, but had lost any real hope in deriving an all-important profit from the program that was vital to the development of any new future plane. Meanwhile, as Boeing grappled with the Dreamliner's fallout, Airbus was upending the market with a new innovation, the A320neo, which had completely dominated the market. It was an upgraded A320 promising about 15% better fuel efficiency. For airlines, that meant huge savings on fuel, their biggest expense. Airlines that had long been loyal to Boeing began eyeing Airbus's more efficient offering. Boeing's cash cow, the 737, a design dating way back to the 1960s, was suddenly at risk of losing its edge. Boeing needed a fast response. Ideally, it would have developed a brand new single aisle jet, but the company was still bogged down by the 787 Dreamliner's problems and wary of another long project. There wasn't time for a clean sheet design. Instead, Boeing quickly updated the 737 yet again as a stopgap. The result was the 737 MAX, essentially the same airframe with bigger, more efficient engines and a few tweaks. It wasn't innovative, but it was the fastest way to offer airlines something comparable to the A320neo. Developing the MAX on a short timeline forced some tough choices. After the Dreamliner fiasco, Boeing kept development much, much closer to home. It stuck with trusted suppliers and brought more work back in-house to avoid another coordination nightmare. Even so, Boeing still squeezed these suppliers by demanding steep price cuts. Most had little choice but to comply, and that left them stretched thin. 
A bigger technical challenge came with the Max's design. The 737's new engines were much larger. Mounting them on the old, lower-slung airframe changed the jet's aerodynamics. As a result, the nose was now more prone to pitching up. Normally, such a change would require extra pilot training. But Boeing had promised airlines that the Max would handle just like the previous 737 models, with no new simulator sessions needed. To achieve that, Boeing's engineers added a software workaround called the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or the MCAS. MCAS would automatically push the nose down if it sensed the plane climbing too steeply. In effect, this made the MAX handle like the older 737s. On paper, this fix solved the problem and allowed Boeing to claim that pilots didn't need retraining. This all seemed like a clever fix, in theory, but in practice it turned out to be catastrophic. The system relied on just one angle of attack sensor, the device that measures the plane's nose angle relative to oncoming air. If that sensor failed or sent bad data, MCAS could repeatedly force down the nose when it shouldn't. Boeing had also failed to properly inform pilots about the system, and as a result, crews were often caught off guard by its actions. In late 2018, a brand new Lion Air 737 MAX crashed into the sea shortly after takeoff in Indonesia, killing everyone on board. Five months later, an Ethiopian Airlines 737 MAX crashed after takeoff under similar circumstances. All 346 people from the two flights lost their lives. In both cases, a faulty sensor triggered MCAS, which repeatedly forced the nose down and overwhelmed the pilots. This immediately sent Boeing into its worst crisis. Within days of the second crash, regulators around the world grounded the entire 737 MAX fleet. Boeing had initially downplayed MCAS as a minor glitch, but now its best-selling plane was grounded indefinitely. It would be nearly two years before the MAX flew again. In the meantime, Boeing halted MAX production entirely. The financial hit was staggering. The company burned through billions of dollars and lost hundreds of orders. Boeing's once ironclad reputation for safety was shattered. The MAX grounding also destabilized Boeing's broader ecosystem. Suppliers that had expanded to meet Boeing's production plans suddenly had to cut back or even shut down. Some suppliers had to lay off thousands of workers. Smaller parts makers with thin margins fared even worse. A few didn't survive at all. Years of aggressive cost cutting had left little slack in the supply chain. So when Boeing's needs dried up overnight, many partners simply couldn't adapt. Even when the MAX returned to service in the late 2020, Boeing's manufacturing network was weakened. Restarting production proved far more difficult than expected. The MAX saga revealed how much Boeing's engineering and safety culture had eroded under pressure. The company's finances were battered and its reputation tarnished. The crisis also exposed deep flaws in Boeing's system of building aeroplanes. Boeing's way of operating was now under intense scrutiny and strain. Even greater challenges lay ahead. To recover, Boeing needed more than reassurance. It needed a symbol. The 777-9 was built to be that symbol, the largest twin-engine aircraft ever made, the centerpiece of Boeing's planned return to dominance. It was meant to prove the company could still build the best plane in the world, or confirm to the world that it no longer could. The 777X was meant to enter service in 2020. It's still on the ground. Unfinished jets line the ramps at Everett, a reminder of a program running six years late. The aircraft is part of a $15 billion program, Boeing's most expensive since the 787. First delivery is now pushed to 2027, and analysts estimate up to $4 billion in charges, money that Boeing simply doesn't have. The company is already carrying more than $40 billion in debt from years in crisis. For airlines, the impact runs deeper than the late delivery. Many built their long-haul strategy around the aircraft a decade ago. Emirates and Qatar Airways alone account for more than 200 of the roughly 350 orders placed for the jet, making the Middle East its core market. Emirates President Tim Clark has called the delay highly expensive, saying that the airline would already be flying 85 of the jets had Boeing met its schedule. Emirates planned to replace most of its 777-300ERs, and Lufthansa built new cabins and training programs around it, and has had to keep its A340s flying years longer than planned. Cathay Pacific removed first class from its 777s and was forced to debut its new Aria business class on a plane it expected to retire by now. Each delay forces airlines to spend more, keeping outdated jets airworthy and to defer efficiencies they paid for years ago. The 777X was meant to reset Boeing's reputation. Instead, it's another reminder of how fragile that recovery still is. This was supposed to show that Boeing had changed. Instead, the 7779 shows the same pattern that crippled the Dreamliner. An overpromised, underdelivered program slowed by certification problems and rework. Every delay forces airlines to adapt again and adds to the billions already spent. Boeing's CEO admits that there's still a mountain of work before certification.
location. For a jet once marketed as its next flagship, the 777-9 has become a case study in delay. After years of lenient supervision, the FAA is now inside Boeing's factories. Auditors cap production rates, check major processes, and sign off on each delivery. They even paused rate increases after a panel blew off a 737 MAX mid-flight in 2024. Boeing can no longer self-certify the way that it once did. For a company once trusted to approve its own planes, the reversal is total. Every inspection is a reminder of how far trust has fallen. Airbus now leads narrowbody sales by almost two to one. Boeing's strength now lies only in jets that still aren't flying. The company is studying a future narrowbody, but nothing will launch before the mid-2030s. Everything now rests on getting the 777X airborne. In recent months, there have been small signs of progress. Dreamliner deliveries have resumed. The MAX 7 is nearing certification, and Cathay Pacific has doubled its 777 order. Lufthansa still expects delivery by 2027. Boeing is hiring engineers again and rebuilding its quality teams. Boeing isn't back, but production has momentum again. Two decades after the quake that once reshaped Boeing for the better, the company is still trying to steady its foundations. Boeing can fix production. Rebuilding confidence will take years. The next question isn't whether Boeing can build planes again, it's whether it can still lead an industry it once defined. Boeing's downfall is rooted in a clash of mindsets. It's old engineering first ethos versus a new obsession with short-term financial gains. As competition with Airbus intensified and airliners become more like commodities, Boeing's leadership fixated on immediate results. Meanwhile, Airbus stuck to a steadier approach, keeping its focus on long-term engineering strength. Under this cost-fixated leadership, Boeing began treating aeroplanes like generic widgets. Management slashed budgets and outsourced aggressively all to cut costs and prop up the stock price. Executives even prioritized share buybacks over investment in new technology. Essentially, they tried to run a cutting edge aerospace company like a bargain basement assembly line. That approach hit a wall. Building jetliners demands Michelin starred standards. You can't run that on the cheap without quality collapsing. Boeing forgot that some things just can't be rushed or done on the cheap. For decades, the company ran itself like that kind of elite kitchen, obsessive about engineering quality and craftsmanship. But under the finance first regime, that proud culture corroded from within. Veteran engineers grew disillusioned and left as the company lurched from crisis to crisis, while leadership offered only lip service to change. With the old god gone and management fixated on quarterly targets, new talent saw little reason to stick around. As a result, Boeing now faces a brain drain at the worst possible time. The company hasn't introduced a new aircraft in nearly 20 years, and just when it needs one, the brain trust to build it is evaporating. The people who once dreamed up Boeing's greatest jets are retired hiring or gone, taking decades of hard-earned know-how with them, an unintended cost of all of that penny-pinching. It was insane to me that Boeing would let its most experienced engineers leave, essentially crippling its own future. Without them in my eyes, it could never even hope to climb out of the hole that it had dug for itself. Their relentless cost-cutting didn't even deliver the profits it wanted. Instead, it created a self-defeating cycle. Shortcuts in design and production led to delays, defects and even disasters. Problems that cost Boeing billions to fix and triggered even even more belt tightening. In chasing quick gains, Boeing undermined its own long-term success, sacrificing the quality and safety that once made it great. By 2025, Boeing is at a low point. Airbus has surged ahead. The A320 family has now overtaken the 737 as the best-selling airliner in history. Boeing, meanwhile, is weighted down by debt and mired in production problems, and its once stellar reputation is badly tarnished. There's no quick fix. No new CEO or shiny jet can undo two decades of decline. These problems run deep and they're ingrained in Boeing's culture. Boeing's way forward won't be easy or quick. The only real solution is to shift its priorities back to what made it great in the first place. It needs to let engineers lead again and to make safety and quality the top priorities, even if that slows things down in the short term. Boeing must remember it's an aeroplane company first and a stock price second. Over 20 years ago, an actual earthquake shook Boeing's world. That external shock spurred a bold transformation and ultimately made the company stronger. Today, Boeing is being rocked by a crisis of its own making. To survive it, the company will need to summon that same spirit of transformation and turn this internal disaster into an opportunity. Boeing has reinvented itself before and it can do so again, but only if it repairs its broken culture and rediscovers its engineering edge. At this point, nothing less will do. I'm Jan. This is the Sky Digest. Because if it's not Boeing, 
might mean something again. Cheers.